So Amanda, thanks for coming in. I'm so happy to meet you and, and I'm looking forward to getting to know you a little Absolutely. bit better. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Glad you're here. <laughs> so uh, the first thing I always like to ask people is mm -hmm. to tell me a little bit about why you became a speech pathologist or why you think that was the career mm -hmm. for you. So growing up, I always knew that I wanted to help people. Mm -hmm. um, I started off as a nursing major because I was very interested in the medical field, but I um, in school, I just knew that wasn't the job for me. And then I found out about speech pathology from um, a mentor I had at mm -hmm. my junior college. And that's when I started doing more research. I knew I wanted to get my master's degree. Mm -hmm. And um, and now I'm here. And um, so really just because of helping people, I love the combination of like the medical field, um, the diversity. You can go into schools, medical. So mm -hmm. I just love the... The field, the, variety. the opportunity, the, yeah. variety. the variety. You'll never get bored. Uh huh. That's yeah. that's actually true. Yeah. Very, very true. Well, the reason I asked that question is because mm -hmm. I want to get to know someone. I want to get to know the real mm -hmm. person. I uh, I want to see what their style is a little bit, and uh, it's a it's a really good open ended question just to get to know the person, which is a really important element in the interview, Absolutely. as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely, I agree, and I, I, I'm looking for a bit, a bit of passion. Right. I want to know that you want to be here. I know. I want yeah. to know that you want to do this job. Mm -hmm. And so when I ask that type of question, I'm really looking for that. You know, is it because somebody told me that it's going to pay more? Right. Or is it because I didn't get into medical school? Those are those are the not right. the answers I'm looking for. Right. The answer I'm looking for is, you know, I do this because I, this is what I want um, to do. And I love it. Right. Absolutely. Well, flexibility is one of the things that mm -hmm. I love to talk about um, in our uh, in our settings. Uh, flexibility is key. Sure. It's something that we really look for in folks that come to work with us. Mm -hmm. um, is there? Can you kind of give me a, a, a sense of a time that you felt like in your career that, or in your schooling or in their time with clients that you had to demonstrate some flexibility? Definitely. Um, you know, within our own clinic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you constantly have to be flexible. You don't know what's happened to mm -hmm. the client prior to that day, what the mood they're going to be in. Mm -hmm. um, and then even as far as cancellations right. or schedule changing mm -hmm. or, you know, during graduate school, you have five courses as right. well as your clinical. So you really have to be flexible mm -hmm. and, um, you know, work your schedule around so that you can really accommodate for all of your clients. Excellent. Well, as I said, flexibility is really key, I think, in being a speech pathologist in almost any setting. We have to work with people, sometimes at their worst, mm -hmm. uh, and we oftentimes don't have control over our, our environment. And so I really want to hear from people how they're going to handle that. How do you plan your day to make sure that you uh, sure. meet all the priorities and that you get everything done and you don't go home, Yeah, you know? Yeah. All stressed out. Of course. <laughs> um, that's a great question. And I think uh, planning is quite an interesting thing because it differs between so many different people. Mm -hmm. But I usually have, I have a weekly planner and I have a monthly planner. Okay. So um, within the monthly planner, I have the larger events. Uh, so let's say I have, uh, you know, maybe I'd keep all of my IEP meetings within the monthly planner. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then on my weekly planner, it's my to-do list. Mm -hmm. My to-do list that I continuously add to every day. Mm -hmm. um, and not only do I, uh, for example, if I have a meeting with a coworker at 3 p.m. on Tuesday, mm -hmm. uh, on Monday, I'll write prepare for the meeting as well. So it's not just the due date. It's also when I'm going to have that preparation time. Mm, very good. Yeah. Right. So you don't miss out on the no. suddenly get shocked. I wake shocked up on something, Tuesday, I, <laughs> you know, and I, I just remember that I have that meeting that mm -hmm. I won't be prepared. I won't be ready. Okay. That sounds like yeah. a good strategy. It will work. Well, I think Ellen hit the nail on the head because I'm not interested in somebody having their schedule in the way I do my schedule. It's a matter of making sure that you have a way to keep track of all the different things that come your way and uh, that you don't lose track of things. And especially as a clinical fellow, I think that there are so many overwhelming things that hit them that may be unexpected, mm -hmm. that I want to make sure that they have a way to keep track of everything so that they're not falling apart. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. As you said, I think um, multitasking is really mm -hmm. key, and there's so many things to learn and do that it's really easy to lose track if you don't have a good system. And so I think that's an excellent question and an excellent thing to share in an interview is here's how I'm going to bring that to the table. This is what I'm going to do to make sure that I'm taking care of everything that needs to get done every day in my job. Right. Absolutely. And, and they may not have had an opportunity to do scheduling for the job. Mm -hmm. So really that's 
the key is how do you manage your life? You know, how do you manage all the moving parts? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think as graduate students, they've had to manage a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So they have some great strategies to bring to the mm -hmm. table, right? right? Sometimes more than some of our more mature and experienced therapists. Right. Um, so really, I think um, say, acknowledging that I have some good systems mm -hmm. in place and I'm going to use those going forward as well is, is great. Right. So part of what we're gonna, what I like to do is kind of find out how you handle different situations. Okay. And so I'm going to ask you some questions about ways that you've interacted with folks or sure. teams that you've been a part of or clients that you may have worked with mm -hmm. to give me some perspective about how you might work with us. Okay, perfect. Uh, so tell me about a time uh, when you weren't able to finish a task that you needed to finish uh, because of lack of information. So you didn't have okay. enough information to handle or mm -hmm. finish a task. How did you handle that? So I handled that. Um, I mean, that has definitely happened to me in um, my, you know, my many clinical experiences so far. And um, whenever I've not had enough information, um, I definitely, it depends on the kind of information I need. So if it's information from like a coworker or um, a higher up, one of my uh -huh. supervisors, then I definitely just want to make sure I have clear communication with them to let them know that I need that. And mm -hmm. not in an aggressive way, but mm -hmm. as in um, help me out. Mm -hmm. I, I need this to finish what I'm doing. Please help me. I have a deadline. Um, and if it's information that I need um, that kind of elsewhere, then I just try and do my own research mm -hmm. trying to collaborate with others um, and hopefully get that information somewhere else and then do it even if it's not on time, get that done as quickly as possible. And then once again, that communication piece. So wh whoever I need to give it to, if it's mm -hmm. not done on time, really communicating with them, look, um, I'm really sorry, this is what's holding me up, mm -hmm. and this is when it's going to be done. I'm doing Perfect. these steps to get that finished and to you. Well, I really, um, when as I'm interviewing people, one of the things I really try to do is ask behavioral interview questions. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a specific style, but it's asking about when you did something, not just how you would do something. Mm -hmm. And it really, as people have to think about it, really guides them towards thinking about themselves versus what they think that I want to hear. Uh, there's always going to be a piece of that, but they, they're going to be thinking back a little bit to opportunities that they've had to uh, use that skill or demonstrate that mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. And so I, it really brings a different element to the interview, and I found it to be really successful. I, I use the same mm -hmm. tactic, I mm -hmm. guess. Uh, and the question that you asked about a, a situation where you don't have enough information mm -hmm is really a key question because that happens a lot. And you want to find out if the, the person who you're interviewing not only knows that they need to do something about it, mm -hmm. but how they're going to solve that problem. And she talked about resources, and she also talked about communication. Mm -hmm. And those were key elements of solving the difficult problem that you presented to her. Absolutely. We don't expect our new graduate CF RPEs to come in mm -hmm. and uh, know everything, right? And um, and 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 their supervisors uh, can't read minds. So sometimes there's things that maybe mm -hmm. the supervisor thought was clear that wasn't, right. and we need that person to be able to have the skills to come back to us and say, "Help, <laughs> I'm not and sure what you needed from me here. I don't have what I need to do this job." Exactly. And, um, and then they can get the help. And the supervisor's not always there. Exactly. Or not always instantly available. So. Absolutely. So knowing how to handle yourself is going to be really key. So yeah, that's a, it's a key mm -hmm. question that I ask regularly for that very reason. Yep. And that you've had experience doing it somehow. Yeah, exactly. Somewhere else. somewhere else. Let's go on a different track. Sure. How do you keep it typically mm -hmm. keep track of um, data mm -hmm. uh, and your documentation mm -hmm. and to make sure that your clients are making progress mm -hmm. uh, and then take the flip side of it. If you see that your data is showing that they're not making progress, mm -hmm. what would you do? Sure. So um, typically for the clients I have now, I have like a running log of what I do with them on a mm -hmm. daily basis. Um, I try and keep it simple. So, you know, for our tick plus and minuses, for some of my other more involved clients, I like to make um, kind of pre-plan some data mm -hmm. sheets that I can put like three in a page to keep myself organized and getting the most um, data to be accurate and have that information readily available whenever I can. And um, if clients aren't making progress and I mm -hmm. see that, then it's definitely Definitely, you know, just looking at, well, am I working on the right thing? Going mm -hmm. back to that assessment piece, seeing where this child is at, looking at myself, seeing if I'm doing the best that I can with them, and then going back to the drawing board and mm -hmm. seeing, well, what can I do? What does this child need? 
this isn't working, so what else can I do? Right. And that's when, you know, that collaboration piece also comes in. And um, also going back and, you know, taking, like, extra courses and seeing, oh, what can I do to better help this child? What is evidence-based right now? What do I need to look at? And just staying up to date on that. Mm -hmm. I feel really mm -hmm. passionate about that um, continuing education. I really enjoy it as well. So, so that you can grow and, yeah. and help your clients all the time. So I often, I often ask a question that is about a negative situation mm -hmm. because I want to see how the candidate will handle stress mm -hmm. and how they have handled stress or how they handle a situation when what they're doing isn't working. Do they look at themselves mm -hmm. or do they potentially blame someone else? So I'm really mm -hmm. looking to see how they handle a negative situation. Absolutely. Situation. I loved how she went back to what, what, what do I need to do differently? Right. You know, so often, you know, we I see people kind of bang their heads against the same wall for a mm -hmm. little while trying to make a goal that they set work for a patient that maybe that wasn't the correct goal mm -hmm. from the beginning. Right. And so that self-analysis, that ability to kind of see that I need to maybe think about what I'm doing a little differently, very impressed with that response. And I think that question is a perfect way to kind of get to also how how they are going to be able to report on outcomes, mm -hmm. right? How are, how are you going to show... Whoever the reviewer is, whoever the payer is, uh, that your services have value. Right. And by collecting data, that's how we show value. And so I think um, each applicant needs to be thinking about what, what value do I bring and how am I going to show that? Right. It's not just the day-to-day. -day. It's Absolutely. the long-term impact of the work they're Absolutely. doing. Absolutely. And uh, so what I always want to kind of find out a little bit about um, supervisory experiences that people have had sure. um, and what you look for in um, your supervisor and partner that you're going to sure. have for that CFRPE experience. Do you have any specific things that you would want to see in that person? Um, I mean, definitely an open line of communication. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if it seems to be a trend within speech pathologists that we're pretty good at communication. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just making sure that uh, we both feel comfortable to ask questions. I want them to be able to give me as much feedback as mm -hmm. possible. This is our time to learn, right. um, and I can take it. Oh, so excellent. I'm fine with them being direct. So I think the, for most CFs that I interview, they really want to know about their supervisor. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to know what kind of supervision that we are going to bring, but I really want to include them in a little bit in that process, and that's mm -hmm. why I ask that sort of question and what are you looking for? So as I'm looking to match them up with the right person, um, I can get information about that. But I also tend to get a, uh, information about either reasonable or unreasonable expectations about what's going to happen in their job. Uh, it's a time when sometimes people will share things that give you some insight as to how they're going to do as exactly. well in other areas. That's ex that's exactly right. And the other piece of that is recognizing how proactive the RPE uh -huh. will be during that uh, supervisory experience because a lot of times there's an expectation that it's still like it was in school uh -huh. where the supervisor is kind of in control of the situation. And so, again, it gives me insight into the kind of employee that uh -huh. person will be because they do need to have a mod uh, uh, they need to have independence uh -huh. as well as be able to recognize that they need supervision and how to use it. Right, absolutely. Proactive communication and the right. ability to collaborate with their supervisor and not uh, and not that necessarily that sense of dependence, but right. that sense of I'm, I'm growing towards independence. Exactly. What would you say is the toughest communication situation that you've faced so far as a grad student speech pathologist? Yes, um, actually when I started to work with, uh, you know, the adult population, uh, you know, when you're having stroke victims, um, TBI, that was a mm -hmm. great challenge for me because most of my background and experience is with children right. um, whom I love, but, you know, I was really thrown out of my comfort zone, but I learned so much. So how did you communicate in that situation? What made it hard and how did you resolve it or come to yeah. a, a better place? I think one is um, the organization of my session. I'm not going to mm -hmm. grab a bunch of toys. I'm not <laughs> right. going to um, say great job. I'm mm -hmm. not going to give high fives mm -hmm. or sticker charts. So, you know, um, the the layout for my session was much different. Uh, you know, also with children, I feel that you uh, have a schedule and you stick to it. Um, as much as I believe in having a, a client-directed session. I also, with, with kids, you are the adult and you kind of have to run it. Okay. But I think when you start to work with 
adults, you have to recognize it's even playing field. Mm -hmm. So if I had uh, this plan, you know, three activities planned for our session, if we only get to one because he needs to talk about something else or have a little bit of counseling as well, you adjust. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit, a little bit. Um, That's right. Yeah. Right. Excellent. So I often ask that type of behavioral question mm -hmm. with communication because I think sometimes as speech pathologists, we assume that we're excellent communicators, mm -hmm. but we're not always perfect <laughs> communicators. And so, again, I would like to see how they analyze their communication mm -hmm. skills, if they're aware of when it's working and when mm -hmm. it's not working, mm -hmm. uh, so that they can make the adjustments they need to make in the context of the work and the collaboration that they're doing. Absolutely. I, f I find that we have a lot of customers in our job. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what setting you work in, if you work in the schools, you have parents, you have teachers, mm -hmm. you have administrators. If you work in the medical setting, you have doctors, nurses, families, patients, the whole shebang. And mm -hmm. communication is key right. to make sure that you're an active part of that interdisciplinary team. And so that ability to adjust your communication style, depending on who you're talking to, is really important that pragmatic skills that mm -hmm. we work on with our patients, with Excellent. our clients, we need to have that same right. approach. And so that ability to articulate, you know, here's how I've adjusted mm -hmm. or here's what I learned from that situation, I think is, is a, a great thing to be able to glean from that candidate when they come into work with right. us. And the perspective taking, mm -hmm. which is another thing that we teach our clients, Absolutely. the ability to take the perspective of the client or the Absolutely. parent as she demonstrated she did in that difficult mm -hmm. communication situation. Absolutely. So you mentioned attending Kasha and ASHA. Mm -hmm. um, what, what kind of involvement have you had with those types of organizations during your schooling? So um, during my schooling, I found out early on um, from one of my great professors um, about these organizations. And then um, just through kind of checking out their websites, really realized, mm -hmm. wow, these organizations, they do a lot for us. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been blessed um, getting involved with Kasha. I just contacted my district director and told her, hey, I want to get involved. I want to mm -hmm. I want to meet people. Um, I think that's one of the benefits of um, Kasha is that you get to meet a lot of people mm -hmm. who have a lot of different specialties. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, so going to like my district level events, volunteering, mm -hmm. um, kind of recruiting other students to get involved. We've had a lot of um, events at my school, just getting students involved. And then that's great for me because um, it's like one big family. And I'm, I'm learning so much. Mm -hmm. um, um, so it's great. So Is that I'm, something you see yourself continuing to do absolutely. after you're done with school, being yeah. involved? Okay. So I'm currently, um, I've been a Cash and Ash member since um, starting um, in the field mm -hmm. in communication disorders as mm -hmm. a student. And um, I'm definitely looking for that life membership. Great. And um, yeah, I want to stay involved. I, I've Excellent. never missed a, an Asha or a Cash convention yet, and nice. I look forward to continue attending. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So I am always looking for somebody that's a lifelong learner, number mm -hmm. one. So I feel like involvement in um, our organizations really provides that a venue for that. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I want someone that's going to be representing my company, my organization mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And uh, and somebody that's going to want to do that, not just at work, but outside of work. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, being involved in CASHA, ASHA, mm -hmm. state organizations, um, national organizations, gives them an opportunity to continue to grow as a clinician and learn from more than just us, than more than just our organization, and bring things back to our organization that they may have learned elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I know certainly from my involvement in CASHA and ASHA and other organizations, I've, I, I get more out of it than I bring, right? I, I, I participate, I get involved, but I learn more from the other people um, that I interact with that I bring back to my organization. And I want the same thing. Uh, from my employees. I love that you asked that question. I've never asked that question. <laughs> and I think I'm going to start asking the question <laughs> like that because it did bring, exa I, I want the same things from the candidates mm -hmm. and what a great way to find out that information. So wonderful. thank you. <laughs> what different tests have you given so far? Oh, so let's see. For adults, um, I love to do the WAB, Western Aphasia Battery mm -hmm. is one of my favorites. I feel like it's very um, all-encompassing. That with a lot of... Um, other kind of informal tests. So when I was in grad school, I came up with my own um, for an assignment, came up mm -hmm. with my own kind of motor speech examination that encompasses a lot of different tests I have given. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like using that, even though it's more informal, using it as a more um, uh, uh, qualitative type of measure. Mm -hmm. So really trying to look at that. And then um, 
really just depends on the adult. Um, but those are some of my favorites. And then working with children, um, I feel like the self is very um, all-encompassing as well. Um, the told, I really enjoy it. I think it's a fast kind of quicker way mm -hmm. to get through things, mm -hmm. especially if this child isn't so involved. Um, and then just depends. Goldman Fristo's my go-to for articulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. but I'm very, um, I mean, I like to see what's new and what's out there. I, I love using like informal measures as well. So I want to make sure I go in there and where, how is this client doing when they're not around me? So whether it be in a classroom or for an adult, whether it be in their home. So just kind of tailoring that assessment piece to them and their needs. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really important element mm -hmm. because you've named a few tests, but mm -hmm. sometimes you're going to see a child mm -hmm. or an adult mm -hmm. who has needs that don't quite fit right mm -hmm. into the test that you're most familiar with. So mm -hmm. how would you go about determining mm -hmm. a different test if you yeah. if you don't have the right one on your shelf that you're really familiar Absolutely. with? Absolutely. So I, I recently just had this experience in my school setting where I was um, assessing um, uh, a new student, and he, I was using the self, um, mm -hmm. which is something classic. All the schools have it. Um, it's very, it gets a lot of good data. But then looking at it, and this this little boy, all the pictures in the self have to do with animals and babies, which this child had um, an aversion to. So oh, he, it was, it was an, infor an unfortunate yep. situation. I talked to the psychologist, um, collaborated with her, mm -hmm. and then from the information that I could get from that standardized test, then I started looking at more informal pieces. And then um, also just collaborating with his family and with a psychologist and seeing, okay, what else can I do that will help get a better picture of this child, whether it be formally or informally, um, to get that other necessary information. Mm -hmm. So kind of just tailoring it really to Did every child. Did you do child. a language sample? Oh, you, yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. With every child, I love to do a language sample um, just when we're playing. So for like play-based ch um, children, or I love doing, um, you've seen those magnet sheets where it's like a scene. So for boys, I have the city, and for girls, I have the house, and but really whatever one they want to do. And I feel like I get a lot of great language from that, mm -hmm. and it's very naturalistic. Okay. Um, so it's something they enjoy. They're having fun while they're doing it. So I found um, being in the school has given given me a lot of, um, I've learned a lot about mm -hmm. doing kind of more naturalistic language samples, which has been great. So what she did so well there is she was asked a very closed, direct question, mm -hmm. what tests have you given? And she not only answered the question, but she gave the why. Mm -hmm. And she expanded to show her knowledge and how she would analyze the situation mm -hmm. to give me the broader information that really is what I was after in the long run. In fact, typically when I ask that question, I ask more about the assessment process. Uh -huh. And for some reason in that situation, I ask the more uh -huh. direct question because as interviewers, we do go back and forth sure. with more direct and more open-ended uh -huh. types of questions. So uh, she hit a home run with that one. Uh, yeah, I really, I, I, I agree. I like how she was able to kind of demonstrate not only that she knew these tests existed, but mm -hmm. that she had probably given them. You know, this right. one's a little more comprehensive. This mm -hmm. one's better for the child that has a global needs. You right. know, she was able to demonstrate that not only do I know these tests, but I've given them and I have a sense of who I'm going to choose them for, right. which was great. Uh, and I, that that's a big question that I typically ask as well, because in, I, I work in the medical setting and it is incredibly important that we have data mm -hmm. once again, and it's not enough for us as therapists just to say, cause I said so, right. <laughs> uh, we really have to have something objective. Right. And so knowledge of those standardized assessment tools that are going to get us that objective data are going to help us develop the plan of care, especially as a, a, a new therapist, you really need that. Uh, that expertise and, and or to be able to gauge, you know, are they familiar with a lot of tests or am I going to need to provide that kind of training and exposure? And finally, the ability to recognize that each test is only appropriate in some yes, situations. Absolutely. And she, she absolutely showed that she had that knowledge. And mm -hmm. that's something that um, many students, well, mm -hmm. graduate students and then new clinicians mm -hmm need more time to be mm -hmm. exposed to others. Mm -hmm. And so she's had some good experiences so far. Absolutely. Well, tell me a little bit about your most challenging client that you ever had or patient or sure. client that you've worked with. Yes, yeah, so it was someone that I saw in the graduate clinic here. Okay. Um, he was on the spectrum. He was five and a half, uh, nonverbal, and um, just very uh, frustrated. Uh -huh. Right? I... I don't understand completely because I, I have my language. Right. However, um, you know you can you can understand where this frustration is mm -hmm. coming from, 
but when you enter and they they run at you and you bite, mm-hmm. they're biting you, mm-hmm. or you know, I have to pick them up to carry mm-hmm. them to the clinic, and they're mm-hmm. kicking and screaming. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's exhausting. Mm-hmm. Um, but by the end, he walked into that clinic by himself. Oh, very so nice. Very nice. It was rewarding. I think if you keep at it and you don't give up, mm-hmm. I do. I'm a firm believer that you'll see something. Mm-hmm. So I use that question about challenging, once again, to provide an open-ended question that allows them to tell me about a time mm-hmm. that they had a problem solve something, right? Right. Some, uh, something that was hard, how did you handle that? Um, because work is hard, and we're going to have hard clients. We're going to have non-compliant clients. Mm-hmm. We're going to have people that don't want to do what we want them to do. And so that's my opportunity to kind of find out how you've handled that in the past and get a sense of how you might handle it in the future or how much support I might need to provide to you. I'm forward with that. I ask the same question quite often. <laughs> it's a good question to get the same information. Have you had the opportunity to work with any clients that um, on dysphagia at all? Um, I have not had the opportunity yet, but um, I'm looking forward to the opportunity. Okay. Um, I'm always, I'm ready to learn. So that mm-hmm. is why I enjoy the field because mm-hmm. there are so many different aspects of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm very interested in dysphagia. I've taken courses on it. I've um, gone to additional um, CEU events, um, not only just at, at the ASHA convention, CASHA mm-hmm. convention, but um, just at district level events. So it's mm-hmm. something I'm very interested in and Great. I'd like to learn more. Great. So I thought she did a nice job of really tying in the fact that even though I asked her about something she didn't have exposure to mm-hmm. directly, right. um, demonstrating that she had indirect, she had some done some things to get herself ready should she need to uh, treat that population. Mm-hmm. That she wasn't coming in cold. She had some good background. That she and that she was going to be an active participant in learning. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and that's really the key is you know how, how if I give you something you haven't done before how are you going to approach it. I think, uh, you know, that that sense of uh, someone's going to teach me how to do this or I'm going to come somewhat prepared and I'm going to use all the resources I have to get ready to do it. Taking personal responsibility as opposed to depending that her new job is going to teach her how to do it. Because the clinical fellows that come to us can't possibly have had experience with all of the different things they're going to be doing in our environments. And so I think it's the most important thing that she said was about taking the personal responsibility mm-hmm. and demonstrating that through either the resources that she knew were available mm-hmm. and the learning opportunities right. and that she was interested. That's the Absolutely. other thing that she said. Absolutely. That she had great interest in it, which is half the battle right there. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Tell me about something that you've done where you had to be creative. Again, sure. clinically thinking, where you had to use your creativity skills and, and uh, how it impacted the client. Sure. So um, recently I had the opportunity to work uh, outside of our campus Mm -hmm. at a place called the Scottish Rite. Mm -hmm. And it was um, a boy who was on the spectrum, uh, nonverbal, and he was really having a difficult, a difficult time. Um, But you know everything that I had planned, all the games, mm-hmm. I all the all the puppets that I brought, all the sensory activities were, mm-hmm. you know, not uh, in his favor that day. So really, just kind of looking around the Scottish Rite, pulling everything that I can to try and find those motivators and those reinforcements mm-hmm. to get him to to gesture and for the eye contact and, you know. It, did it finally together. work? It did. It yeah. did finally work. So you had to also not only be creative, but you had to think on your feet. Sure. That's a really important skill. Yes. Good for you. That's Thank great. You. So I asked the creativity question because I don't consider myself creative. <laughs> and so I've learned that we do have to be creative. Oh, and yeah. part of that is flexibility and part of it is thinking on your feet. Mm-hmm. But just really, again, it's an open-ended question so that I can learn a little bit about how the clinician is going to handle herself. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, Also recognizing that sometimes creativity falls into a very simple category. Um, If you go back to those of us who've raised children, (laughs) where sometimes the most interesting toy Mm -hmm. was the box Mm -hmm. that the toy came in. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with our clients. And so I want to see if they have the ability to recognize what that means. Absolutely. And I think we've talked about flexibility before, and and I think Mm -hmm. creativity goes right along with that. How am I going to handle a situation where I have to think on my feet, as you said? And I think uh, that's definitely something as therapists we need to have. Mm -hmm. If, If you're relying on a session to go exactly as planned, you're going to be disappointed 
Sometimes. All the time. <laughs> Regularly. <laughs> right. You know, things change and we have to change with right. it. And we have to be creative. We have to think on our feet. We have to use things we didn't plan on using and um, draw on past experience, uh, draw on what we know about that client. And uh, so that that's a question I'm adding to my repertoire now <laughs> because I haven't asked that question before. See, we learn too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So what questions do you have for me? Um, what kind of supervision do you provide or who will I be matched up with? What other opportunities do you have for me to collaborate with other individuals in the field? What would my supervision look like? How many clinics are there within? What is your, let me see, your company's mantra for therapy? What does your day look like in the setting in which you work? Well, I love that they asked questions about the job. Yeah. And they came prepared with questions. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I have, well, I'll, I'll see as a red flag a little bit mm -hmm. is when someone says, no, you've answered all mm -hmm. my questions and they have nothing. Mm -hmm. So the advice I would give to anyone who's preparing for an interview mm -hmm. is to come in with questions mm -hmm. that show a knowledge about the company, Correct. about the position, and an interest in how that position will work for them mm -hmm. and help them grow. Another thing that I like to see throughout is somebody that's taking notes yes. um, or keeping track of things so that they, they may have a question later or they, you know, or, or they come prepared with some information that they want to glean from me. Because um, I think some people come thinking I'm just gleaning information from them. Um, but really, and, and aside from things like benefits and pay, um, which don't, don't necessarily need to be part of the interview process, um, it, uh, I want to, once again, see someone that's engaged, that wants to know about my organization and, w and what we want, mm -hmm. what we represent. Mm -hmm. I love the question about, uh, you know, sort of your mantra, you know, what's your, great? you know, what, what's, what, what is your tagline? What is it? What's your um, mission statement? Those types of things. Or having looked at it ahead of time mm -hmm. online. For many organizations, the mission statement is posted right online. Look at that and say something like, I love your mission statement where it says this. How could I be a part of that? Or how does the company really exemplify that? Yes. Questions that show that they want to fit into our culture. Exactly. Well, thank you so thank much you for your time much. today. I appreciate it. It's Absolutely. great to get to know you. I look forward to hearing back from you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You so much. Thank okay. you so much well, for the opportunity. Ellen, it was a great, great to meet you. Yes, Shelley. And I we'll really let you know it. soon. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> okay. very much for the Thanks. opportunity. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Okay. Well, thank you so much for thank your time. You. It was great to meet you. Thank you, too. Well, a smile and a handshake. <laughs> and uh, it's. I think it's important for candidates to know that they may not get information uh -huh. at the end of the interview. Sometimes they may get information right. about whether or not mm -hmm. there's a possibility for the position in the mm -hmm. future, but sometimes they may not. Mm -hmm. And so just the ability to be enthusiastic and... Mm -hmm. uh, professional and uh, uh, smiling. They all smile uh, very yes. nicely. And, Absolutely. You know, so Absolutely. they show that they had a good time during the interview. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, how they interact with us in a stressful situation is, is going to be a lot like how they're going to interact with a client True. or a patient or a child mm -hmm. or a family. So being able to see how they uh, conclude their time with us mm -hmm. is also going to be helpful in seeing how they're going to close up a session. Right. Uh, so I, I like to see, you know, do, do we end with a thank you so much, goodbye, and um, follow up. And sometimes they may be able to ask at the very end uh, some questions like, when can I expect to hear from right. you? Or uh, do you need any further information from mm -hmm. me before I go or when mm -hmm. I leave? Uh, and sometimes there are situations with interviews where we ask candidates to send something else, Absolutely. for example, a written report mm -hmm. uh, as an example of their mm -hmm. writing or possibly um, uh, some reference information mm -hmm. or something like that. So yeah. to be prepared on how they're going to follow up Absolutely. would be important as well. Uh, and I recently had a candidate, uh, two candidates that came in that were um, very equally matched. We, mm -hmm. we interviewed both um, myself and the CF supervisor, and our um, our partnership development person was also involved in terms of figuring out whether who was going to be the best fit and getting this person on board. And uh, at the end of the interview, we were having a really hard time deciding between these two candidates. And and one of them sent a lovely thank you note to me. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one sent a lovely thank you note to all three of us. Mm -hmm. And um, that really kind of tipped the balance, right? That so was a great opportunity for that person to understand the value that each one of those people brought to the team. Yes. The, the time that each one of those people took for them mm 
while I might have been the ultimate decision maker, each one of those other people is really important. And so uh, that that was a great opportunity. That that same candidate, both of those candidates brought some proactively brought some samples of their mm-hmm. documentation to the interview, which I thought was great too. Yeah, it gives me a sense of how you what your language looks like, mm-hmm. how you're going to present, not just in person but in writing. Um, so I didn't even have to ask and for being that. Prepared. Absolutely, <laughs> right. being prepared, knowing that that's something you might want. Mm-hmm. I've got it right here. <laughs> um, is is that's how you're going to show up to work as well, right? That's the the persona that I that that you're going to present to my clients, to my customers, uh, and to your patients. I love what you said about the thank you notes. That's recognition of the whole team. Mm-hmm. I know that when I do face-to-face interviews, that first impression is made sometimes even before the person walks in the door. Uh, Things like timeliness and confirmation of the appointment time and things like that. And planning ahead, I once had an interview with someone who got a flat tire on the way, and so obviously she was late. Uh, However... We didn't get the phone call that she was going to be late until about 45 minutes later. And the reason that was told to us was that her phone had been locked in the car. So unfortunately, in that situation, it demonstrated all the things that we are talking about Mm -hmm. as far as being an organized person Mm -hmm. and, you know, planning ahead and being able to multitask. Uh, That kind of showed the flip side Mm -hmm. of it. And so when you're going to an interview, you have to... Even though we want you to be relaxed, we want you to also uh, show your professional side. And it takes some good planning Mm -hmm. and a little bit of nervousness Mm -hmm. to make sure that you cover your bases, Mm -hmm. even in the worst situation. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Very true. Very true. I think that (laughs) if if you've done this for a while, you've had those types of situations where you can see how someone handles a difficult situation. Mm Uh, with grace and, you know, things happen, life Mm -hmm. happens. Um, But there's the person that has that same situation, but calls you right away and says, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And, you know, can I come in a little bit later or can we reschedule or that person that, you know, has 15 other things that have happened in the meantime. Um, And so really that, that ability to handle a difficult situation with grace is what I'm going to need from you at work. (laughs) And so how you handle a situation with me is going to be really telling. Of course, timeliness is always important. I think it even starts with the resume. You know, did, what did you highlight there on your resume when I get it? It's going to help me to understand questions to ask you. It's going to help me understand your experience. So if your resume starts with where you went to school and just list your three internships and the kinds of people you saw there, it's not as interesting mm-hmm. as if you tell me a little bit more about something special you did there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so not just necessarily the diagnoses that you may have seen or the kinds of kids you may have seen, but I participated in a panel or I participated in this, that, or the other, or I helped do this. Um, it's what was give unique about information. your internship at a hospital? Absolutely. That would be different than my experience mm-hmm. at a hospital. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. What did you bring to your to that experience? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And uh, so, th- and then, you know, as we look at um, preparation, did you come prepared? Even though you may have sent me a copy of your resume, did you bring one for me mm-hmm. as well? Mm-hmm. Um, do you have all that organized? Are you ready? Uh, are you uh, prepared and ready to go? And uh, when you walk in, do you give me a, a nice smile and a, a greeting and a handshake? Mm-hmm. And then, of course, we always look at the attire, Mm -hmm. Uh, professional, uh, neat, well-coiffed hair, you know, I mean, it doesn't have to be fancy, but but you you want someone to be, look like they're put together and ready for a professional situation. And that they recognize that it's professional, uh, even to the point of not overdoing it, for example, not wearing uh, spiky heels or, wearing clothing that would be appropriate for the environment mm-hmm. also. I think that's really key. I, I, I always think to myself, if this is as dressed up as you're probably going to get, right? You're coming for a job interview mm-hmm. and you're trying to show me what you've got. And so if that's not looking uh, kind of up to our standards, that's a real red flag for mm-hmm. me that this, 
you know, you're probably, when you actually come to work, maybe not even going to be looking as nice as you do right now. Right. Um, so somebody told me about way back, and it's an old adage, and people have probably heard it before, but you want to dress for the job that you want to have, not necessarily the job that you have now. So you don't dress like a student. Mm-hmm. You want to dress like a professional speech pathologist out in the world. And so um, I, I've used that throughout my career, and it's served me well to just think about who am I going to be interacting with, and, and what's their job, mm-hmm. and how would they dress for their job, and I'm going to try to match that. 